Good morning, church. It is good to be with you as always. Always an honor to be able to bring a message from the Word of God. This is our Sunday morning Bible class, and because of the present distress, I thought it best for us to make a change of our study topic. We've been studying the table of context. How do we interpret the Bible, God's Word? There are so many divisions in the so-called Christian world. How can we know that what we are doing and what we are believing is in fact the truth? And we've talked about the fact that the, the hermeneutic, the, the science of interpretation, that we in the church follow is that which is called the inductive approach. What that means is we read everything in the Bible, in its context, and we draw off, that's what induction is, we draw off the proper conclusions. We talked about the fact that the Bible is filled with figurative language, and we talked about well, how do you know what's figurative and what's literal? Well, the inductive hermeneutic, we take things literally unless we cannot take them literally. When we read about the trees uh, clapping their hands and the hills jumping for joy, we understand that that's figurative language. When we are told things that cannot physically be true, then we understand they're figurative. And again, we understand this in everyday conversation. When I tell you that I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, um, one, no I couldn't, two, no I'm not really that hungry, we understand it's a figure of speech to aid us in communication. We then talked about how we apply this word that we can understand it for every aspect of our lives. That it may not address specific issues that we have, but it certainly addresses principles in our lives. You know, it doesn't tell us how to deal with online problems, but it tells us how to deal with all problems, and ultimately the, the nature of man does not change. We've talked about the kingdom, what it teaches us about the kingdom. But it's really, this class has always been a, a question and answer forum in that uh, I would bring forward uh, some topic. The last couple of topics, we talked about uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and what that really meant. Uh, John's baptism, what was that all about? And we were going to get into the study of angels. And I, and I might get back to doing that, but it just seemed like for those kind of studies, it's better to be able to be together so that questions can be asked when we're talking about these topics. So I have decided to shelve the table of content, shelve the table of contents, uh, context, and to go in a different direction. We're going to talk more about the Bible itself as a book, about understanding it, because if, if this is the book that God has given us that contains all the information unto life and godliness, everything we need to know in order to live this life well, and everything we need to know in order to be able to go to heaven and live there eternally, then we should know this book pretty good. If we're going to be judged, as Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48, by his words, it would seem like we should know his words and the word of God extremely well. So we're going to start talking about the Bible, breaking up into its parts, and understanding how they fit into the big picture. One way you might say it is, why are they in the Bible? Why is the book of Genesis in the Bible? Why does the, each chapter in that book, why is it important? How does it help us, not only the people then, but how does it help us today? That's what we're going to do. And we're going to begin by talking about the, the Old Testament. And, and you know me, I'm really struggling having to sit down and not being able to, to walk around a bit, but uh, I will do what I can. Um, we're going to start by talking about the Old Testament. The Bible itself breaks down into two major parts. There is the Old Testament, 39 books, and there is the New Testament, 27 books. The Old Testament tells us all the things we know with regards to the nature of God. It teaches us about man's problem with sin. It teaches us about the seed promise, that God has promised something that will be the solution to our sin problem. And obviously the New Testament is the revealing of what that great mystery was, that it was Christ Jesus, God coming in the flesh, dying for our sins, and gathering together in one body, not Jews and Gentiles anymore, not patriarchal system and mosaic system, but now the Christian system. One body of people, Christians, and they are the kingdom. 
So this Old Testament was the preview for the New Testament. And as has been said, if you removed all of the Old Testament quotes from the New Testament, you wouldn't have much left because much of the New Testament is simply saying, do you remember what God said through the prophets? Well, this is that. Like we studied in our Wednesday study of the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and they began to speak in tongues, the men around them, you know, what's this about? Are these guys drunk or something? And Peter says, no, no, no. What you're seeing right now is a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. This is that. So that's how that is to be used. So let's consider the Old Testament first. The Old Testament divides into five main groups of books. We have, and, it, and it's, a, it's an easy number thing, it's 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. Uh, there are the five books of the Torah, there are the 12 books of history, there are the five books of wisdom, there are the five books of the major prophets, and then the 12 books of the minor prophets. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. So let's begin by looking at the individual books that comprise these groups. And uh, because we don't have PowerPoint with us, um, we're going to do PowerPoint old school. We're going to talk about the divisions of the Bible, specifically the Old Testament. So the first book, we have five books of the Torah. And here are your five books of the Torah. Uh, in the Greek, it's called the Pentateuch, which obviously means five. So um, we have the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis is the book of beginnings. It talks about the creation of everything, it talks about the beginning of sin and the sin problem, and it holds the beginning of that seed promise, which is Christ. Exodus talks about the departure of the Jews being pulled out of Egypt to follow Moses. And it is the, as it says there, the beginning of the Mosaic system. The book of Leviticus is about things pertaining to the Levites, thus the name. Um, so it is filled with the laws that the Levites were going to be the priests of and the teachers of, of the law of Moses, which again was just for the Jews, not for the patriarchs. The book of Numbers mainly is about a census of Israel. It's literally about numbers. And some history of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that the Jews had to do because of their lack of faith in going in to take the land. Deuteronomy literally means a second giving of the law. It is the detailing of the law of Moses that in large degree had already been done for the first generation, but as the first generation had to die in the wilderness because of their lack of faith, Deuteronomy is that second giving, second telling of the law to the next generation who was actually going to be able to go in and take possession of the promised land, unlike their forefathers, who were not able to because they were not faithful. So we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books of the Torah, often called the books of Moses. You hear of Moses and the prophets wrote about this, and that's the two divisions. There's the first five books, the books of Moses, and then there are the others. The next category we have of books in the Bible are the books of history, and there are 12 of those. There is the book of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, I guess I'll do this differently, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. 12 books. So um, how do we remember things? Uh, we've talked about mnemonic devices that we can use that, that helps us. Um, however you can come up with a system to memorize these books, I know there are songs that are out there that we teach our young uh, to help them remember the books of the Bible. Um, I became a Christian at 36, so uh, I don't use those children's songs. I had to come up with other ways. The five books of uh, the Torah, pretty straightforward, fairly easy to remember. Um, the books of history, uh, I've got the silly, there's three, okay? 
and, and, and then there's six, and then there's three, right? That's how 12 divides up. And three, the first three, is Joshua judges Ruth. And, and he really shouldn't do that. That's the way I remember the first three. Joshua judges Ruth. And then you get in the first and seconds. First and second Samuel. First and second Kings. First and second Chronicles. And then you have the E-N-E prophets, as I say to myself. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So Joshua judges Ruth, and he, he ought not. First and second Samuel. First and second Kings. First and second Chronicles. Any Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So those are the 12 books of history. Now what they cover quickly, whoops, wrong one, PowerPoint problems. Uh, Joshua, it details the entrance and the conquest and the division of the promised land. First five books was the whole history of mankind, the beginning to the getting ready to go in and take possession of the land. Joshua, in the books of history, we actually have the entrance, the conquering of the land, and the division of the land among the different tribes. The book of Judges, which follows, is the chaotic and dreadful time from the death of Joshua to the rise of Samuel. That sad book, which is um, encapsulated in the idea or, or summarized so well in the statement that we find three or four times in the book itself, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And obviously, that was a time of great troubles. Then there's the book of Ruth, which is kind of the, the balm or the, uh, the comfort after the discomfort of the book of Judges. In Ruth, it's that beautiful story of faith in the midst and the times of the Judges. First Samuel is the history of the nation of Israel from the rise of Samuel to the death of King Saul. Second Samuel is the history of Israel from the death of King Saul to the building of the altar in Jerusalem by King David. First Kings is a history of Israel from the death of King David to the death of King Jehoshaphat. Second Kings is a history of Israel from the death of King Ahaziah, Ahab's son, to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. First Chronicles is very similar. First and Second Chronicles is very similar to First and Second Kings. They cover pretty much the same amount of time. The issue is uh, First and Second Kings. The audience of First and Second Kings were Jews in exile, and you might think here are the people of God in exile saying. What in the world happened? I, I thought we were the people of God. And First and Second Kings explains how they got there. It details the, the up and down of faithfulness and unfaithfulness, uh, ultimately resulting in an unfaithfulness so despicable that God said, that's it, no more. I'm not going to have an end. They're going to go into captivity for 70 years. So First and Second Kings focuses on the history of the United Kingdom, but then it talks about the northern kingdom of Israel as well as the southern kingdom of Judah once they divide it. And it gives history of both kings and both nations. The northern kingdom being taken into, well, being destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC and the southern kingdom being destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. First and second Chronicles is written to an audience after the exile, Jews who had come out of Babylonian captivity and were trying to reestablish the worship of Jehovah God. So the audience here, it's filled with a focus of just the southern nation of Judah. Don't read much about the northern kingdom in Chronicles. And it has a lot more information, like the first nine chapters of Chronicles, genealogy of the priesthood, so that they could reinstitute the worship of Jehovah God. So, uh, as we talked about, first, and, first Kings is the history of Israel from David to King Jehoshaphat. I can't help it, jumping Jehoshaphat. Second Kings is the history of Israel from the death of King Ahaziah, Ahab's son, to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. First Chronicles is the history of Israel from the death of King Saul to the death of King David. And again, the first nine chapters devoted to providing genealogies for the returning Babylonian captives. Second Chronicles 
is the history of Israel with a focus on Judah after the division from the death of King David to the decree of King Cyrus of Persia allowing the Jews to return from the Babylonian captivity. Um, King Cyrus of Persia having conquered the Babylonians and then allowing the Jews to return. Then we have the book of Ezra. It is a history of the two returns from Babylonian captivity under Zerubbabel and Ezra, respectively. Then we have Nehemiah, the history of the third return from Babylonian captivity under Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. It's always interesting to find these things in the Bible, but there were three instances of the Jews being taken into captivity. Um, in 606 BC, we had uh, Daniel being taken into Babylonian captivity. And then in 597 BC, we had Ezekiel being taken with a group of Jews into Babylonian captivity. And then in 586, we had the, the final destruction of Jerusalem and the taking into captivity of the rest. So there were three main waves of Jews being taken into captivity, and the Bible documents three waves of the return from captivity. In Ezra, we have two. We have the, the one under Zerubbabel, and then the second one under Ezra. And then Nehemiah, the uh, return under Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls. And then the last book in the books of history is the book of Esther. It is the history of how the Jews in captivity were saved from annihilation. And the events of Esther take place between chapters 6 and 7 of Ezra. Most of the books of history are chronological, except for Esther, which again fits in between chapters 6 and and seven. There's roughly a 70-year gap between those two chapters, and that's where Esther, when Esther takes place. <clears throat> so, five books of the Torah, 12 books of history, and then that brings us to the five books of wisdom. They are the book of Job, which is a study of righteousness of God and, and how man should deal with suffering. Then we have the book of Psalms, a collection songs that teach about prayer and the proper expression of emotion by God's people, followed by the book of Proverbs, a collection of the wisdom of King Solomon to aid God's people in their living in this world. We, we live in this world. There's the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon's treatise on successful life, quote, under the sun, unquote. And then there's the Song of Solomon, King Solomon's treatise on the joys of marriage. And I just got a text. I got to remember to turn that off so you don't have to listen to uh, Matt Smith uh, give that message. So the five books of wisdom, we have Job, and Job is a, a theodicy. Now, theodicy means a study of the righteousness of God. And again, that's the name we apply to it. Um, Job is a study of why do bad things sometimes happen to good people? And what's that all about? How are we to understand it? How are we supposed to deal with those things? And Job is an excellent study to help us understand that sometimes bad things do happen to good people and it's not their fault. So how do they respond? Well, Job is that great example of the way we are to respond is knowing God's nature and trusting him, remaining faithful no matter what we face because God is good and he'll take care of us. Then we have the, the book of Psalms, 150 beautiful songs, the emotion, the heart of the people of God, uh, filled with great um, uplifting songs on faith and, and very discouraging songs on what it can feel like to be one of those good people that's going through hard times. And here's a song by one of God's people going through those hard times and teaches us so much because there are times when people think that having doubt is a sin, and it's not. Having doubt is a natural thing. If you don't doubt, then I would really wonder whether you believe or really think at all. Um, and the Psalms are filled with Psalms, such as those of David, which are often basically David saying, God, I'm, I'm going through a really difficult time right now. Everybody's after me and out to get me. I'm on the run. They're going to kill me. And where are you? I, I thought you were my helper. I thought you said you were going to take care of me. And yet they're going to kill me. But then that's the doubt. But then David 
talks his way through it. David says, but, but no, I, I know you. And I trust in you. And, and you've kept your promises. I'll stay faithful. And I'll trust in you. And those are beautiful messages for us when sometimes we feel like we're alone. God's not with us and everybody's against us. We get to read there that we're not alone. Other people have gone through that. And we also can know God is with them. Then there's the book of Proverbs. Many people struggle with the idea of the book of Proverbs being in the Bible, and the reason they do is because it's not terribly a religious book. It talks about a lot of money stuff, you know? Don't, don't be a cosigner when a friend goes to buy something. What does that have to do with religion? Well, it has a lot to do with religion. We live in this world, and the, the things of this world trouble us. And if you cosign for your friend, and uh, he, uh, he doesn't do what's right, uh, you might have a falling out with your friend, and you might want to get into a fight with your friend, and now we're starting to talk about religious things, aren't we? So Proverbs helps us to deal with the things of this world wisely. And one of the main themes through Proverbs is also that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. If you don't fear God, then you're probably not going to be wise and approach the world as, as you ought, because... As they say, if you don't believe in God, then you're probably going to believe in anything. Then we have the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a, if, if there were only 11 chapters, it'd be the most depressing book in the Bible, but there are 12 chapters. And it's about a man trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment without God. Is it possible? Can we fill our lives and be uh, fulfilled just in and of the things of this world? And the answer is no. The answer is you can gather all the wealth to you. You can have all the fun in the world. You can gather all the wisdom in the world to you. You can have and engage in all the pleasure in the world. But at the end of the day, this is obviously a great abbreviation, but at the end of the day, you're going to die. And what's that about? And is it worthwhile? Is it worthwhile to gather all the wealth and make all these incredible um, constructions if you're just going to die and some fool's going to inherit it, what, what was your life about? It seems like it was a waste of time. Or as the writer Solomon says, vanity of vanities, a chasing after the wind. Chapter 12 obviously helps us to understand that no, God is the only way that we can have fulfillment because everyone's going to die and everyone's going to be brought into judgment. So the most important thing of this life is to seek God and keep his commandments. It is man's everything. Everything else is the gravy that goes along. And then the last book of wisdom being um, Song of Solomon. And the Song of Solomon is, is one of the books not studied a great deal in the church. Um, um, one, because it's probably one of the most difficult books to understand. It is difficult at times from verse to verse to understand who's talking and to whom are they talking. But in general, the Song of Solomon is a beautiful treatise about marriage, this wonderful thing that God gave to us, the love of a man and a woman together, one flesh for life. That's what the Song of Solomon is, the joys of that. Because remember, marriage gives us a hint of that relationship between God and man. As man and woman on the horizontal, as God and man on the vertical. That's what we learn. All right, so after the five books of wisdom, we then have the five books of the major prophets. And the major prophets are not major prophets because they're better than the minor prophets or they're more well-known. It's just that in general, the major prophets' writings are much longer, 50-some chapters, 60-some chapters, versus the minor chapters or the minor prophets, which are often much shorter. So the five major prophets... Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. You, you want the uh, mnemonic device? Uh, let's see. I just love eating donuts, which is not only true, but it's a helpful mnemonic device. I just love eating donuts. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Isaiah is a prophet of Judah from the reign of King Uzzah through the reign of King Hezekiah. He is believed to have been killed by King Manasseh. Jeremiah was a prophet of Judah from the reign of King Josiah through the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. 
Lamentations is a writing of Jeremiah in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem. It is the writing of his lamentations after the destruction of the city. Ezekiel was a prophet writing from Babylonian captivity. Remember that second Babylonian captivity began in 597 B.C. On the river Kibar, concerning the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And Daniel, remember, remember a part of the first wave of into captivity of 606 B.C., a prophet writing from Babylonian captivity in Babylon. So, the five major prophets. Isaiah, he wrote about the coming destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. He prophesied about the coming destruction of Judah, which occurred in 586 B.C., and he detailed a lot of the fates of these nations that were troubling Israel. He announces that, yes, Assyria will destroy the northern kingdom and will trouble Judah greatly, but Assyria will be destroyed also. Same with Babylon. Um, Isaiah has been called the Little Bible because the Bible is 66 books and Isaiah is 66 chapters. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah seem to detail uh, judgment and doom. Um, the Old Testament of the Bible talks about all the problems we have, but there's this promise that's coming, but it doesn't come in the Old Testament. And then the last 27 chapters of Isaiah are about the suffering servant and words of comfort to Jerusalem. And the last 27 books of the Bible are the New Testament. Jesus, the suffering servant, has come, and God's people may have comfort. So, a little Bible. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, and it is the detailing of the sad state of affairs in Jerusalem, the downward spiral, you might say, of lack of faith, and as the impending judgment comes and the punishment, their refusal to repent and turn back to God. Lamentations again, Jeremiah's heart-wrenching detailing of the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, um, probably my favorite verse is when Jeremiah cries out to those who are walking by, is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you? Look what has happened. Prophet Ezekiel wrote about from captivity. He wrote not in Babylon, but in the area of the river Kibar, and he wrote about the fact that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. Uh, many of the Jews believed that their captivity would just be temporary, that they would soon go back to Israel because, you know, we're the people of God and no one could take us, temple of God, temple of God. Um, but it was Ezekiel's message to tell them, no, nope, this is going to happen. It's going to be destroyed. And it's in Ezekiel that we see that vision that Ezekiel was given of the glory of God leaving the temple, leaving it empty, desolate, so that they could know that's just a building. That's not the temple of God anymore. And then Daniel. Daniel wrote for a long time. And the first six chapters, very straightforward, very encouraging. The last uh, six not so much, uh, a little more difficult. Uh, prophecies concerning the return from captivity and the coming of the Christ and the, the way that the kingdom shall be dealt with. So that's the major prophets. That brings us finally to the 12 minor prophets. Uh, I'm going to have to pause here. All right, I'm back. The 12 minor prophets, we have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Well, how in the world do you remember these? Well, I've shared with you my mnemonic device, and it's a silly thing, but again, sometimes the silly is best because it helps you to remember. Um, the way I remember the 12 minor prophets is he just ate old Obadiah, or excuse me, he just ate old Jonah, might not have zinc, hates zinc maybe. Nonsense, but rememberable because of that. He just ate old Jonah. He, Hosea, just Joel, ate Amos, old Obadiah, Jonah, Jonah. Might not have zinc, Micah, might, not, Nahum, have, Habakkuk, zinc, 
Zephaniah. Hates zinc, maybe. Hates Haggai. Um, zinc, Zechariah, maybe Malachi. So, again, whatever silliness you can use, it helps you to remember. The 12 minor prophets, they are scattered historically through the history of Israel. They are not going to be in chronological order. So in general, we have Hosea, and he is a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel when they've divided during the reigns of King Uzziah through Hezekiah. Joel, he was a prophet that was typified by the coming phrase of day of the Lord, which means a day of judgment. And again, um, Joel's dating is is disputed by many, but is probably the oldest of the minor prophets. There she is again. Uh, Amos is a farmer and a herdsman called to prophesy to the northern kingdom about the coming judgment. So Hosea and Amos were writing to the northern kingdom specifically, trying to warn them that the Assyrians are going to come unless they repent. And then we have Obadiah. He was a prophet, not actually prophesying to the people of Israel or about them, but he was preaching about the coming judgment on Edom. You remember, Edom was the kingdom that was founded by Esau, Jacob's brother. So family, still family, and that's why that's dealt with. Then we have Jonah, and Jonah's a prophet called to warn Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, to repent or be destroyed. Micah was a contemporary prophet of Isaiah in Judah and spoke about many of the same things, just in a much uh, shorter uh, amount of writing. Nahum is a prophet who spoke of the coming judgment of Nineveh. The way to remember Jonah and Nahum, Nahum uh, begins where Jonah finished. Jonah was warning Nineveh about the coming destruction if they didn't repent, and they did repent. And in Jonah ends NAH. Well, Nahum begins NAH, and unfortunately their repentance was not substantial. And so... Uh, he prophesied, Nahum did, of the coming destruction, that they had their chance, now it's coming. The prophet Habakkuk, he was a prophet of Judah during unfaithful times. Similar to Job, this book is a theodicy, a study of the righteousness of God. Habakkuk's complaint is, he looks around the southern kingdom of Israel and he says, Lord, your people are wicked and they're not doing what they're supposed to. Why, when are you going to do something? And God answers and says, yeah, I'm going to do something. I'm sending the Babylonians, and they're going to punish my people. And Habakkuk goes, you can't. They're worse than we are. You wouldn't do that, would you? God says, I'll punish uh, Babylon too. Don't worry about that. But you just write down what I told you to write down. That way, when the faithful read my word, they can run. and Maybe they'll survive. And the end of Habakkuk is him understanding God's in control. We need to get on on uh, board with him. The last four of the minor prophets, Zephaniah is a prophet, the great, great grandson of King Hezekiah, who warned Jerusalem during the reign of King Josiah about the coming judgment. Haggai was a post-exilic um, prophet. He wrote after their return from exile, admonishing the returned uh, exiles to put God first in their restoration efforts. They were all busy about building their houses and, uh, and planting their crops. But he said, wait, you better put God first or none of this is going to work out. Then Zechariah, another post-exilic prophet, contemporary with Haggai, urging Judah unto spiritual restoration. Yep, you're, you're, you've come back and you're restoring the nation, but let's remember to restore the worship of Jehovah God. And then Malachi, believed to be the last of the writing prophets. Uh, some think Nehemiah, but those two are close. Um, as I mentioned there, he was contemporary with Nehemiah, urging Judah not to forget or neglect God if they want to be blessed by God. And Malachi was that last word in the Old Testament before the roughly 400 years of silence from God, the deep breath before the fulfillment of that promise. That's why Malachi ends with, look for the forerunner. God's going to send one like Ezekiel or like Elijah He's going to come and prepare the way. And that's how the Old Testament ends. So again, 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. Five books of the Torah. Genesis, 
Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and um, Deuteronomy. Then we have the 12 books of history, right? Joshua judges Ruth, and he ought not. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And then we have the five books of wisdom. We have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Then the five uh, um, major prophets. I just love eating donuts, don't you? Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and uh, Daniel. And then finally, the 12 minor prophets. Uh, he just ate old Jonah, might not have zinc, hate zinc, maybe. So Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, um, uh, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The Old Testament, preparing us for the new, preparing us for the Christ who is to come, and blessed for us, has come. Next class, we're going to start looking at each of these books individually of the Old Testament we've talked about, starting with Genesis, and we're going to talk about how they fit in to that big picture of what God has given us this in his book. So that's what we're going to do. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email them to me or text me, and I'd be happy to address them at the beginning of every class. Um, but let's conclude this class by going to our God in prayer. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for the life that you have given us to live. Father, we're so thankful for your word and all the provision you've given to us that we may know who you are and who we are and the things we should be about, that we might be with you together and fulfill your joy. Please bless us in our study. Help us to gain wisdom and understanding and make application in our lives so we may shine your light in this world. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you.